Good evening, and thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Tom Sheehan. I'm the organist and associate director of music at the National Cathedral just up the hill in, here in Washington. But I'm really honored tonight to be the uh, harpsichord performer for this uh, Wanda Landowska celebration and, um, and event. That was the Sonata in D Major by Domenico Scarlatti. And um, this, that uh, was featured on a recording of all of the Scarlatti sonatas by uh, Landowska, about which you'll be hearing a little bit more later. Uh, that piece will will come back later on this evening. But for now, I'll turn it over to our next presenter. Thank you. Greetings. Welcome to today's program: Restitution, Restoration, and Repertoire: New Findings in the Wanda Landowska and Denise Restute Papers at the Library of Congress. I'm Carolyn Ward Bamford from the Music Division and a curator of musical instruments. We are on the stage where Wanda Landowska performed in concert nearly 100 years ago. And on this stage today, as you've just heard the harpsichord, it was one of hers, and it is nearly 100 years old as well. Around the sounds of this play-out harpsichord, we will weave the themes of restitution 
restoration, and repertoire in telling the story of Landowska's life, her music, her teaching, her musical instruments, books, manuscripts, and this harpsichord. Durable, according to Webster's Dictionary, means being able to exist for a long time without significant deterioration in quality or value. Enduring. Wanda Landowska's harpsichord is durable. Wanda Landowska's legacy is enduring. And they will endure here at the Library of Congress with the gift of her cultural heritage collection. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, my name is Carla Chapeau, and I'm from the University of California, Berkeley. I want to thank the Library of Congress and its musical instrument curator, Carolyn ward bamford for holding this panel and performance and for inviting me to contribute. Thanks also to the Toby Foundation for sponsoring this event. When musical instruments are used in performance, displayed, or exhibited, we often learn a little more about the instrument than the maker's name, if that. We, are rare, we rarely learn of the instrument's provenance, the history of its ownership and possession. Provenance is the portal to the object biography and the lives connected to it. It also potentially enhances our understanding of how a particular instrument is contextualized in its history involving prior owners, performers, collectors, composers, and others, sometimes over the centuries, and bringing cultural, political, and social history into the mix for a much richer and more layered understanding of the instrument and its historical encounters. During the Nazi era, musical material culture, including musical instruments, were confiscated in significant numbers. In some instances, they were recovered and returned providing an opportunity to listen to the instrument, to study it, and to consider it in the context of its path through history, not as a tabla rasa. In the case of Wanda Landowska's play, El Harpsichord, on stage this evening in the Coolidge Auditorium, it has a dramatic World War II history. When the German military invaded France in, 19, in May 1940, Wanda Landowska was at the height of her career. She was an internationally renowned harps harpsichord and piano soloist, an accomplished scholar, writer, teacher, and composer. She had amassed an extensive music library, including manuscripts, rare printed music, books, and an impressive musical instrument collection. Landowska's love of Bach and other composers of the 17th and 18th centuries had led her earlier in her life to study and investigate antique musical instruments and the role that they might play in the performance and she stated, quote, I came to the realization that the keyboard works of the 17th and 18th centuries ought to be played on the instrument for which they had been composed, the harpsichord. This idea took complete possession of me, and I decided to carry it out. I started to look for an instrument. The modern reconstructions made around 1900 by Erard and Pleyel were not the ones I dreamt of, end quote. Landauss said that she set out Quote, to reconstitute a harpsichord approaching as closely as possible those of the middle 18th century when they had reached the height of their glory for richness of registers and beauty of sonority, end quote. In this pursuit, she turned to Gustave Lyon, the director of the Playel piano firm in Paris, and his chief engineer, Monsieur Lamy, who embarked on a new harpsichord design for Landowska. One of her requirements was a 16-foot register, adding a lower octave. In 1912, Playel um, Grand Model Harpsichord was completed and launched into the world, which Landowska introduced the, um, at the Bach Festival in Breslau. In 1922, Playel uh, added an iron frame to its Grand Model to maintain the string tension, and Landowska performed, recorded, and taught on this Playel model although not without some criticism for its, design, for its design then and now. I will defer to Thomas Sheehan and Barbara and Thomas Wolf, our harps, harpsichord experts, for a more technical discussion of these design changes and their impact. 
Landowska was born in Warsaw in 1879, educated there as well as in Berlin and Paris, and settled in saint lou la forêt outside of Paris in 1925, where she established uh, her school of ancient music. And um, here you can see, uh, hopefully, the um, uh, entrance to the concert hall. Um, she built a small concert hall at, this, at her home and maintained a large music library and collection of musical instruments. Um, and as you can see from this Playel advertisement, she also promoted Playel's instruments, saying in this ad, quote, I love my Playel harpsichord. It's my best friend, my closest confidant, end quote. So here you see um, Playel included a promotional inscription on many of its grand models, touting Landowska's involvement in the design of her and her preference for this Playel model. This inscription on the Library of Congress's Playel in the hall today reads, quote, the lower register, which the ancients called 16 feet, was added to Playel harpsichords beginning in 1912, following the request and suggestions of Wanda Landowska. With Hitler's rise to power in January of 1933, composers and musicians who did not comport with Nazi policies began to experience persecution based on religion and race, as well as politics and aesthetic views. By 1940, um, because she was Polish and of Jewish heritage, Landowska was blacklisted by the Nazis as a musician and composer in the first edition of the notorious book Lexicon of Jews in Music by German musicologists Theo Stengel and Herbert Gehrig. Landowska's assistant, Denise Ristu, recalled of life in France just before the Nazi invasion. We waited and waited each day, believing that something would happen and we would not have to go. We were still there when the Nazis invaded the north of France, and that was on May 10, 1940. As they advanced, we could hear the bombing from, out, from our house in St. Lou, end quote. On June 10, 1940, four days before the Germans occupied Paris, Landowska fled her home and music school in St. Louis La Forêt. Ristu recalled of this hurried flight that they carried only what they could quickly save, quote, a few indispensable books in music scores and some notebooks, end quote. By one estimate, Landowska's library contained approximately 10,000 objects. Landowska and Ristu um, headed south and stopped briefly at La Loire on the Loire River. And according to Ristu, thousands of frightened people were trying to catch the train south, but all trains had stopped. Um, they were able um, to travel by car to Banyuls sur Mer in the Pyrenees, where sculptor Aristide Meillot uh, found Landowska a place to stay. In September 1940, the contents of Landowska's home and music school were confiscated by the Sonderstab Musique. The Sonderstab Musique was a special music task force led by musicologist Dr. Herbert Gehrig, uh, and he is the uh, gentleman on the right uh, on, on the slide, which carried out musical confiscations in France and other regions. A subdivision of the much larger Einstadtstab Reichsschleiter Rosenberg, the ERR, and there's an organizational chart here, basically on a topical basis by uh, uh, property type. Uh, the ERR was led by Alfred Rosenberg in the center on the image on the left. He was the, uh, the ER, um, he headed the um, ERR, the, or the Nazi organization that plundered cultural property in various nations and occupied Europe. So the ERR became operational in France in July 1940. Landowska's books, sheet music, musical manuscripts, artwork, phonograph records, and musical instrument collection were packed by the staff of the Sonderstab Musique and 15 French workers over a two-week period, filling 53 or 54 crates, which was initially stored at the Louvre depot before shipment to the Berlin musical offices. We have an inventory from the Sonderstab Musique. Um, for the property they confiscated, prepared on February 19th, 1941. And I don't know if uh, you can see, I have highlighted in red, instrument number 30, list Chambalo 3046, it's actually 80463, and 1926651. This is the instrument on stage this evening, this in Coolidge Auditorium. And uh, we know this, 
because the Sonnenstab Musik inventory, and you see a little section of it there, um, with the Playel manufacturing numbers, which matches the numbers today on the Playel on stage. The center photograph shows a Playel manufacturing number stamped into the instrument's jackboard. It's the same number. The photograph on the right are Playel's numbers that I photographed from underneath the instrument. On February 5th and 13th, 1940, the French government protested to the French authorities in France regarding the confiscation of Landowska's musical collection, asserting that her property constituted irreplaceable French artistic cultural patrimony. The Germans flatly rejected this request on January 8th of 41, stating that the seizure by the Sonderstadt Musique was made on the basis of an order by Hitler, and that the property was not French cultural patrimony, but artistic property of a Polish Jewish national. And Wanda Landowska. Moreover, the German response stated that Landowska had repeatedly and uh, decisively supported Jews who were well known as enemies of Germany, referring to Landowska's 1940 performance with violinist Bronislaw Huberman at a concert in the Grand Opera House in Paris to support Polish aid. Meanwhile, Landowska remained in the south of France, uh, where she waited for about 18 months to obtain the documents required for passage out of Europe, which she acquired with the help of Varian Fry, an American journalist working for the Emergency Rescue Committee. In her 62nd year, Landowska traveled from the south of France through Spain and to Lisbon. She made this trip with what is today the Library of Congress's second Landowska playel harpsichord, uh, which was not looted, but has its own dramatic World War II history, which I will mention very briefly at the end of the talk. Landowska and her students set sail for New York Harbor on the SS Exeter on November 28, 1941. And here you see the ship manifest. She arrived in the US on December 8, 1941, one day after the attack of Pearl Harbor. Um, she listed herself on the manifest as Wanda Lou Ney Landowska, her married name and her maiden name, place of birth Warsaw, Poland, citizen of France, and her race or people as Hebrew. Landowska's assistant, Ristu, recalled of their arrival in New York, quote, we did look rather suspicious, arriving in America with practically no luggage and one harpsichord. <laughs> Restu recalled of Ellis Island, quote, we didn't know why we were there or why we were being held. Finally, we were told that our passports were only good for three months. We were there all day, all night, the next day, and the next day, and they were actually spelled on, uh, held on a special inquiry. Local musicians uh, and friends came to their aid, and Restu remarked, quote, we were released, but we had to deposit a bond of $500 for each of us. That was $1,000 and we had only a total of $1,300 to our names. So we, were, we arrived in the New World with a harpsichord and $300. Meanwhile, in Germany, Landowska's looted collection, originally shipped to Berlin, had been moved to Leipzig in 1943. But in December of 43, Allied bombing reported, reportedly hit the storage location in Leipzig, where the Sonderstab Musik had deposited Landowska's and other musical um, objects. What remained was evacuated to two locations, two main locations, but there were other uh, items apparently scattered to various deposits in the countryside. One major cache was in Langenau Castle in Hirschberg, in Silesia, but this, came, this area came under Russian and Polish control in the spring of 45, and the post-war uh, disposition of most of these evacuated objects remains unclear. Some speculate that these confiscated materials were taken to Russia. The second main evacuation location was a monastery in Bavaria in the countryside, which is where this harpsichord in the Library of Congress is, uh, on stage this evening was deposited for safekeeping by the Nazi Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg. Long before the war ended, the fine arts community, museum directors, curators, and scholars became alarmed at the potential of the war for the destruction of cultural property in Europe. In the US, these concerns were brought to the attention of President Roosevelt, who on August 20th, 1943, established the American Commission for the Protection and Salvage of Artistic and Historic Monuments in War Areas. To carry out this mission, the US military established the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives section of the US Army. After the war, this division was involved in locating, protecting, and returning looted and displaced cultural property in war-torn Europe. 
So the US Army on May 30th, 1945, discovered what it referred to as, quote, a castle full of pianos, accordions, violins, etc., believed to have come from French museums, end quote, in what turned out to be uh, the monastery of Redden Haslock. Many of Wondowska's confiscated musical instruments and some of her library materials were amid this deposit of looted musical property, largely stolen in France. The US Army reported that this cache consisted of about 65 pianos, spinets, harmoniums, and other instruments, modern and antique in crates, as well as 80 crates of music and books, many with French markings. It was estimated that it would take 25 truckloads for the ERR material alone. Um, confiscated property was intermingled with other property also evacuated for safekeeping from Allied bombing. The U.S. Army described the conditions at Raiden Hoslock as chaotic, with materials distributed throughout the building, some in locked rooms, but others not. Many of the crates had been opened, with some damage and loss of property reported. The U.S. Army further noted the lack of security and the fragile nature of the musical instruments before transferring the objects by truck to the Allied-run Munich Central Collecting Port Point for inventory protection and return. Landowska's play L, however, um, today on the, on the stage, uh, was not found until December 10th, 1945. A U.S. Army memorandum stated, quote, the play L harpsichorded, harpsichord now located in the second floor hallway of the military government quarters at El Toting, which is understood to have been removed from right in the Hoslock by the former Berghausen detachment, is a special model invented by Madame Landowska. First Lieutenant Dota Conrad of the Office of Military Government Bavaria will arrive at Al Toting 12 December, bringing with him an expert packer from Munich to create this instrument for removal. It is requested that he be given all possible assistance, end quote. Now Dota Conrad, in addition to being a, a monuments man, um, was a singer and a close friend of Landowska's, and he actively searched for her looted musical property. Now, Landowska had prepared a detailed inventory of her confiscated property. And in this slide, you can see there is an entry here. She submitted this to the French government, and this, this, uh, her inventory was utilized in the post-war search for her property. An excerpt from this inventory includes her play L harpsichord, number 192665, among other items. This number matches the number of the Sondersov Musique inventory for Landowska and the number of the Playel on stage this evening. For the many thousands of confiscated objects that were processed by the Allies for repatriation to the presumed nation of origin, property cards were prepared for those that passed through the Allied Munich Central Collecting Point, and this is what the building looked like. Um, these cards included an object description, condition, presumed owner, identifying marks, and other information. So here you see uh, the property card for this harpsichord on stage. Landowska's looted play L was deposited by the ERR at Redden Hoslock and was identified by property card number Munich, uh, Munich number 18376, Redden Hoslock 1659. The play L harpsichord on stage with us this evening was repatriated to France from the Munich Central Collecting Point on January 9th, 1946. So here you see a slide of the shipment back to France from Munich. Um, it was the first of several shipments from Munich to France from Landowska's, of Landowska's uh, looted musical property. The others, others followed on July 31st of 46, September 30th of 46, and finally April 27th of 49, based on research to date. And I have here um, a slide. This, this uh, is a provisional list that identifies Landowska's property recovered and listed in the Munich's uh, property cards as having been deposited at Redden Hoslock by the ERR and recovered by the US Army. So there were quite a few items as you can see. Many of Landowska's confiscated musical instruments and library items remain missing today. And um, here are a few slides to just show you a few. And I think one of these slides is in the display, one of these images is in the display case. We learned from correspondence um, between Dota Conrad and Wanda Landowska, as well as Play L Records, that the Landowska, uh, that Land Landowska had a possessory right to the Play L on stage that was confiscated from her home in France. 
but she did not own it at the time. Playa loaned Landowska the harpsichord for her use, but Sonderstab Musik had seized it with a false belief that it was Polish Jewish owned property. Playel demanded payment for its looted harpsichords, there were actually two, and the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg paid Playel 30,000 francs for the harpsichord on stage tonight. Landowska needed more than one instrument to be able to accept performance engagements outside of New York, and on June 3, 1945, she wrote to Mr. Reignard at Playel asking to purchase two large model harpsichords. She said, quote, Given that these instruments will be intended for my concert tours in all of America, this would be magnificent advertisement for Playel, making the point that, quote, interest for the harpsichord is very alive in America, end quote. But Playel had been devastated during the German occupation of France. Playel replied via telegram on June 8th of 45, stating, quote, manufacturing of harpsichords interrupted, impossible to supply for several years, end quote. By letter of June 14, 45, the director of Playel informed Landowska of the alarming situation and that harpsichord production had been suspended in 39 and had not been restarted, partly because of, quote, progressive shrinking of our staff due to the forced absence of draftees, then prisoners, and finally, the labor conscriptions for work in Germany, end quote. Playel reported that it had been completely deprived of necessary supplies, that its lumberyard and certain buildings were destroyed by German aerial bombings in August of 44, resulting in the destruction of Playel's technical folders on the production of harpsichords. Playel wrote that the, most, that the cost of exportation would be prohibitive and that future possibilities could not be predicted, and his desire for Landowska to understand the details in order to realize, quote, exactly the cruel impossibility, end quote, that Playel faced in not being able to fulfill her order. But in 1946, Playel agreed to loan Landowska the Playel it had put at her disposal um, before the war that was confiscated, recovered, and returned to France and is on stage tonight. The instrument was shipped to Landowska in New York on the SS Indochinois via the French transport company Bourguignon Frere through New York correspondent's Seven Seas Mercantile Transport Company. The records reflect many difficulties with duty and customs uh, issues. So um, one obtains a fascinating glimpse of the drama unfolding over this harpsichord on stage in 1940 and after the war through the original Playa Ledger, which you see on this slide, um, preserved in the archive of the Musée de la Musique in Paris. Page 53 of the ledger includes the entry for this playel on stage, uh, and um, here is a brief translation um, with a close-up of the relevant entries. The instrument appears to have been made on or about September 9th, 1932. Fabrication number is 80463, exit number 192665. Playel notes that German authorities were located at Hotel Commodore Boulevard Hausmann in Paris and had taken an instrument that Playel had lent to Landowska. As a result, on October 29, 1940, the Einsatzstab paid Playel the 30,000 francs for the instrument. And we can also see from this ledger that on March 14, 1955, Playel finally sold this instrument to Landowska for 285. 250 francs, or about $805. The Library of Congress collection preserves many records that document the evolving provenance of the play on stage this evening. And um, in the paperwork, and I think this document is in the display case, the original, um, uh, this is uh, evidence of the instrument shipment from France to Landowska in New York on September 11, 1946. So uh, Landowska photographed the October 1946 arrival in New York of what she referred to here as Play L51, also 192665, the instrument on stage, in its shipping crate. Um, and here you see, this is an undated photograph, but it documents the two Library of Congress Play Ls in Landowska's home, both with the dramatic wartime stories. One confiscated by the Nazis and recovered by the US Army, number 51, and the second, number 57, taken by, uh, by Landowska on her flight from the south of France. 
So a few words about the second line Vasca play out in the Library of Congress, which can be seen in the music division's reading room. This instrument was purchased uh, for Landowska by one of her students and sent to Landowska in the south of France in early 1941. Denise Rastut recalled in a 1974 interview that one of Landowska's students from Switzerland had come to visit her um, at Bagnol sur Mer. This student was reportedly Elizabeth, 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 excuse me, Isabel Neff, who was, according to Rastut, distressed to see Landowska without a harpsichord and sold her life insurance policy to raise funds to buy the last available play out in Paris. Another of Landowska's students managed to ship that play out harpsichord from Paris to Landowska in the south of France. Where students stated of how the student managed to get this harpsichord to Landowska, quote, that's a very amusing story because she went straight to the commander in Paris and was received by a German officer. She told him she wanted to send a piano to the south of France. A piano, he asked. You want permission to ship a piano? Well, she replied, it's really a harpsichord. For whom, he asked. For Wanda Landowska, she replied. Oh, I admire her music so much, he exclaimed. I am from Vienna. So he signed the permit. Playel shipped the harpsichord in a box, which had her name written across it in letters a foot high, and it went through the whole of France without incident. It was a miracle, end quote. So here you see the Playa ledger that lists this second harpsichord as number 194188, purchased by Landowska, it says in the ledger, although we know from Denise Rastut that a student paid for it. Uh, it was purchased on February 7th, 1941. Landowska took this instrument with her uh, from the south of France through Spain and on the SS Exeter in Lisbon on November 28th, 1941, bound for Paris. Um, here you see a slide where you can see the, the instrument and the number on the jackboard and the number underneath the instrument, so it is a match. Um, and here you see the migration of these two instruments uh, during this very short period of time, 1940 to 46, and both these instruments are today in the Library of Congress. Landowska died on August 16, 1959, in Lakeville, Connecticut, at the age of 80. Upon Denise Ristute's passing in 2004, she bequeathed to the Library of Congress the musical collection she had inherited from Landowska, consisting of approximately 41,000 items, as well as two playel harpsichords, a chalice clavichord, a Steinway piano, and other property, stating in a letter to a friend in 1994 of the Library of Congress, it seems to me that this is one of the most durable and responsible institutions. After all that Landowska and Rastut had lived through and lost, durability and preservation meant a great deal. When, when one studies or listens to a musical instrument in performance, as we listen tonight, one takes in a universe. That universe is much larger if one knows where an instrument has been, who has played and owned it, and in what countries and political climates and cultural circumstances it has traversed. Thank you. You're about to hear three pieces of music, um, the first of which is called Versus. It is by Wanda Landowska. It was originally written for the piano. I've adapted this for the harpsichord, for this particular harpsichord. Um, I think this is a, uh, it was written very early on when she was, uh, before she had started really getting interested in harpsichord music. So I think she would probably approve of its uh, translation, transcription into, into harpsichord performance. And then the final piece is a harpsichord arrangement of a Polish folk song which is associated with weddings. And Landowska recorded this piece on this instrument and I've attempted as much as possible to recreate the effect of it.
Okay. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming out to the library this evening. My name is uh, Brett Werb, and uh, thank you, Library of Congress, for the invitation to take part in this uh, fascinating program. Can everybody hear me? I can't see you. But... Okay, the name Wanda Landowska is uh, not all that well known nowadays, present company happily excluded. Um, but as this uh, slightly exaggerated cover illustration by uh, Bruce McCall suggests, there was a time when Landowska was indeed the world's hottest harpsichordist, a superstar virtuoso, an internationally celebrated concert and recording artist, and pioneer proponent of the so-called Back to Bach movement. Close up on that one. <laughs> Blantowska's career spanned well over 50 years. She was, moreover, a world class personality, a charismatic figure whose early music advocacy and extravagant deportment, both on and off stage, attracted a cultish fan base and a coterie of worshipful disciples. In tribute to uh, this flair for theatrics, then, I'll uh, myself begin somewhat dramatically. Uh, you're about to hear an excerpt from Landowska's last ever European recording. If you listen closely at uh, around uh, 30 seconds in, uh, you'll discover why this mo uh, moment marked a career turning point as well as the end of an era. Uh, the piece will probably sound a little familiar. <laughs> When this recording was made in June 1940, the World War was well underway, German armies were on the move, and that threatening, thundering sound caught on the record is thought to be a barrage of anti-aircraft fire aimed at warplanes over Paris. According to reports, her studio engineers dive for cover, but it said, and as could be heard, Landowska played on. Uh, I, an eyewitness attested that the more noise the bombs made, the more she concentrated on the music. Uh, yet the end of that Scarlatti session marked the beginning of Landowska's transition from honored French citizen artist, a knight of the Legion of Honor, no less, to uprooted itinerant refugee. Long in denial about the racial agenda of Germany's rulers, she was finally convinced by trusted friends that indeed her life was in danger. As her secretary and companion, Denise Restu, explained, Landowska was, first of all, of Jewish origin, although she was two generations converted to Catholicism. In addition to this Jewish background, she was also a Pole. As far as the Nazis were concerned, these were the worst things one could imagine. Also, they appreciated art, and they knew the collection she had. She loved France, she loved her house, she didn't want to leave. Nonetheless, as we've heard uh, from the previous presentation, she packed up a few belongings from her estate near Paris and fled almost immediately. More than a year of provisional safe havens ensued in unoccupied France, and during which time uh, she implausibly managed to acquire by post uh, from Switzerland and through France a brand new Playel harpsichord uh, before she and her companion Restu reached Lisbon and then at last New York and um, they arrived around that infamous uh, news day, that famously infamous news day, um, the day the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Landowska, an exile in her 60s with very little money, very little English, but with a very big harpsichord and an ego to match, quickly rebuilt her career and within a few years was flourishing in the new world. As before, her celebrity was principally as a performer and recording artist, secondarily as a much sought after instructor of uh, keyboard instruments. In Europe, though, she also enjoyed considerable reputation as a scholar, researcher, and polemicist. 
Her major legacies to the music world were the reestablishment of the harpsichord as a part of the contemporary instrumentarium. Uh, pre Landowska was often dismissed as an outmoded relic or curiosity and the principle now commonplace of historically informed performance practice. Unquestionably a founder and icon of the early music renaissance, Landowska also inspired a host of 20th century composers to create new works for her and her instrument, most notably Manuel de Falla and Francis Poulenc, but also Jean Francais, Henri Sauguet, uh, Daniel Pinkham, and as we've uh, heard, um, Witold Ludoswavsky. She inspired countless other creative efforts. The music historian Richard Taruskins even suggested that Landowska's playing and composing may have been an early stimulus for Stravinsky's neoclassic phase. Landowska herself can be placed among those moderns to a fashion new repertoire for the harpsichord. She was, in fact, an accomplished composer who, while still in her teens, received a full regimen of instruction in harmony and counterpoint at the Hochschule in Berlin. Uh, her first works for solo piano appeared in print before she turned 20. I believe the uh, library's archivist, Chris Harden, will be sharing some samples of her schoolwork during his presentation. And uh, uh, Tom Sheehan has already performed a pair of Landowska compositions, the Berceuse, originally for piano, uh, and uh, her own arrangement of the Polish wedding song, Leichmielu, the hop. Uh, the name refers not to a dance step, uh, but to hops, the flowery herb used in the brewing of beer. Uh, but which has ancient ritual connotations in Polish folklore. So just a few words now about Landowska's relationship to folklore and folklorists. Like many Polish musicians of, as they say, Jewish descent, Landowska was deeply drawn to the folk music and dance of her native country. She rhapsodized about childhood summers spent in the countryside near Kielce in south-central Poland, where, again according to uh, Denis Restu, she heard and sang with relish innumerable folk songs and danced with Polish peasants' authentic mazurkas and polonaises. Landowska even claimed that she herself collected and transcribed many folk melodies. Such was her interest in this material. Beyond this ethnographic, uh, these ethnographic pursuits, however, she appraised these melodies from the perspective not of a romanticist, but of a modernist, a modernist composer. The only major work of hers to be published, and not even in her lifetime, is a suite of Polish folk songs reconceived for harpsichord and chamber ensemble. I guess that's a page from that publication. It's uh, published uh, by Hildegard Music um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, Landowska had yet another point of contact with folklore, albeit of a different sort, and that connection was through her husband, Henrik, also known as Henri Lev. We learn very little about Lev from biographical writings on Landowska, not much beyond the fact that he was killed in a traffic accident in Berlin in 1919. Restu says of him that he was a journalist, an actor, and a remarkable ethnologist specializing in Hebrew folklore. True enough, Lev was a journalist and ethnologist from Lublin and remarkable for his time precisely because he was a Polish Jewish journalist and folklorist. That is, his field was Polish Jewish folklore and his studies were written and published in Polish. Lev had been described as the moving spirit among researchers who believed Jewish culture and customs were a legitimate part of the country's treasury of folklore. In Lev's day and beyond, this was considered a controversial point of view. But after eloping to Paris with Wanda in 1900, Lev dropped those pursuits and instead devoted himself full-time to managing his increasingly famous spouse's ever more busy career. He even changed his name to Henri Lev Landowski. Yet, though he clearly loomed large in her life, one finds, as said, little mention of him in Landowska's writings and interviews. If her ties to, to Jewish ethnicity have been played down, and she and others certainly did soft penalties, then it might at least be noted that her husband and collaborator of nearly 20 years was both the compiler of a popular collection of Jewish jokes and stories, and the translator into Polish of the novel Stempenu, a classic account of the lives and culture of itinerant Jewish musicians, Klesmorin, uh, by the famed Yiddish writer Shalom Leif. And these are uh, two of uh, his publications uh, translated into Polish from the Yiddish, uh, both uh, published uh, around the same time uh, that, uh, that he was um, wooing Landowska and married Landowska. 
And a look at, La, at the list of Landowska's uh, compositions um, perhaps reveals uh, Lev's impact on her artistic direction. And for there, uh, we find among several examples of reworked Polish folk music, both a Hebrew poem and a Rhapsody Oriental. As you've already heard from Carla, well, many Latin Landowska manuscripts were lost when the Germans plundered her estate. However, the Rhapsody, once regarded as missing, has turned up in the library's Landowska Ristu collection. I believe it may even be an arrangement, or I suspect that anyway, of the Hebrew poem judiciously retitled. In any case, the increasing accessibility of the Landowska Ristu archive raises the possibility that we may have an opportunity to hear some of this music uh, performed one day. Clearly, there is more to the story of Wanda Landowska as a creative musician and composer and uh, more yet to learn about her relationship with her mysterious consort, Henrik Liv, and about her often underplayed connection to her Polish Jewish heritage. I'm going to move to the next uh, media, and again, I'm not sure whether this is going to work, but I will try to close with a clip from a TV program produced not long after Landowska's death. Uh, in it, the actress uh, Agnes Moorhead portrays Landowska reading from her private diaries. This material is largely missing from the writings Denis Rastu collected, translated, and published in the volume Landowska on Music. Toward the end of that book, Rastu even states that her mentor's biographical writings will form the nucleus of a subsequent volume. That volume, unfortunately, never did appear, so until the library's archive uh, yields up more treasures, uh, Moorhead's reading offers our best glimpse yet at what these still unexplored uh, personal journals might reveal about otherwise unspoken aspects of Landowska's uh, life and art. I dare not open this new notebook. It frightens me. And yet it is still empty. But all that oppresses me, this tumult, this anxiety, this dreadful sorrow, I feel it bursting in me, and I, I do not have the courage to analyze it or to write about it. This empty notebook tells me all that it does not contain. From morning to evening and from evening to morning, I am running away from the specter of war, but it does not leave me. This morning in the news, in a small Lithuanian town, they have cut out the tongues of the priests. Others condemned to death have had to dig their own graves. One horror supersedes another, and not knowing where I go, I shut myself in with a well-tempered clavier. A while ago, it was with the score of Don Giovanni, but I almost prefer box fugues because of their technical difficulties. This worry of a professional order becomes immediate preoccupation and hides the nightmare, at least for a few hours. This monstrous and gigantic misunderstanding shaking humanity, this whirlpool of hatred, whipped and driven to a paroxysm, is it spontaneous? How can one witness what is happening? Witness, withstand, and survive. Last night, I accidentally spilled some boiling water on my left hand. This physical pain appeased me. I thought I'm suffering a little, so little in comparison with what my Aunt Ruzia must have suffered in Poland. Who was with her? Where and how did she perish? I claim my part of distress in life. The idea of being sheltered seems unjust and odious to me. And thank you for your attention. Good evening. My name is Christopher Harton. I'm an assistant section head in the music division, and I was the lead archivist on the processing of the Wanda Lenowska and Denise Rastu papers. It's my sincere pleasure to have an opportunity to share a few words about the truly remarkable collection that has enabled our program today. Consisting of more than 41,000 items and 250 containers of material, Spanning from the latter half of the 19th century through the end of the 20th, the collection documents the life and legacy 
of one of the foremost performers, innovators, teachers, and scholars of the harpsichord. It also serves as an extraordinary resource and grim reminder of the tortured historical period that Wundowska navigated to ensure that her musical contributions would not meet the same fate as many of the materials and instruments that pass through her hands. The legacy of Landowska owes a great deal to the efforts of Denise Rustu, her student, secretary, personal assistant, and eventual caretaker. Rustu bore witness to the activities and thoughts of Landowska on a daily basis and dutifully recorded everything that flowed from the mouth of Mamuzia, as she was affectionately known, from profound musical ideas to requests for produce from the local market. Rustu's relationship with Landowska was not merely one of idolization, but rather discipleship, as even in her handwriting, Rustu imitated Landowska, much to the chagrin of those who processed the collection. <laughs> Rustu ultimately accompanied Landowska to New York in December 1941 and then to Lakeville, Connecticut in 1949. After Landowska's death 10 years later, she dedicated her life to the only thing that made sense, the meticulous preservation of Landowska's legacy and personal property. From 1971, until her own death in 2004, Rustu operated the Landowska Center from the picturesque country home known as Oak Knoll in modern day Salisbury, Connecticut, serving as library, museum, teaching studio, and living space for more than a quarter century. The home aged alongside its occupant and yet somehow remained frozen in time as if Landowska herself still inhabited the house nearly 50 years later. Music division staff examining the materials that Rustu bequeathed to the library were awestruck by the volumes upon volumes of antiquarian scores, stacks of papers, realia, and instruments present in the space. As movers transferred boxes and carefully carried a pair of playoff harpsichords, a clavichord, and a piano out of Oak Knoll, there was no question that the legacy of Landowska would continue, but who would be its next Rustu? When I first joined the staff of the music division back in 2009, no collection seemed too tall in order to process. Even an unruly, sprawling collection of materials pertaining to an instrument that I did not play, a performer with whom I was not familiar, and written partially in a handful of languages that I did not read. I realized the folly of my enthusiasm in short order, but I also very much saw an opportunity to learn about a spirited woman who captured the minds of audiences and even nations with her approach to performance, writing, and scholarship. And so I learned. Landowska's story of hard-nosed triumph and resilience in the face of war was incredibly inspiring, and it very much remains so as Europe once again stares down the wanton destruction of art and culture. The Landowska and Rustu papers contain nine series or groupings of materials for harpsichordists and scholars of performance practice the music series provides a direct link to Landowska's technical understanding of the harpsichord and her musicality. Consisting largely of printed scores obtained after her immigration to the United States in 1941, these materials feature annotations by the Landowska and Rustu for many of her most notably performed works. Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, Poulin's Concert Champatre, Handel's Suites for Harpsichord, and countless others. Also present are manuscript scores and sketches of Landowska's own compositions, one just eloquently performed, including a series of sketchbooks from her years in Breslau and Berlin from 1893 
through 1896. Landowska was a prolific author of letters, journals, and literary works on historic performance practice and musical reception. Correspondence in the collection feels nearly 40 boxes and reflects not only Landowska and Rustu's relationships with renowned composers, students, and performers such as Jose Turby, Aaron Copeland, Rafael Puyano, and Francis Pula, but also lesser-known figures whose actions and observations, as Carla has demonstrated, are critical to reconstructing Landowska's life and legacy. Singer Dota Conrad, students Elsa Schoenicke and Dia Matho, and Rustu herself. Both Landowska and Rustu fastidiously logged daily journals and left a paper trail of their teaching engagements, social gatherings, mundane business activities, and thoughts on musical topics stretching near continuously from 1894 through 1999. Whether perched at her desk with pen in hand or gesticulating dramatically in summer master classes, Landowska was an endless font of musical ideas. She opined frequently on concepts of authenticity, nationality, progress, and popular appreciation of music, most notably laid bare in her monograph, Musique Ancienne, or Music of the Past first published in 1909. Landowska had an anecdote for just about everything. Behind her dramatic, emotive veneer was an extraordinarily witty and humorous persona. In an undated artist survey for RCA Victor, Landowska was asked who was the most interesting person she had ever met and why. Her response, an elephant, because his nose is bigger than mine. <laughs> Although relatively little of Landowska's personal property crossed the Atlantic in 1941, we are fortunate that thousands of photographs were among those indispensable items that survived this tumultuous period. The earliest of these photographs date from the late 1890s. One can clearly see that even as a child, Landowska was quite photogenic. The collection features wonderful images of her in just about every setting imaginable. At the play out, in her concert hall at saint Lou, with leading dignitaries of the period, Paderewski, Honegger, Faya, and Mio, just to name a few. Landowska's nimble, spider-like fingers were also captured for posterity. Of particular significance, as Carla has detailed her images and accompanying inventories of Landowska's collection of musical instruments and her library of antiquarian scores at Sanlo. In the case of the instruments, these photographs represent the last, and perhaps in some cases only surviving images of the intact items. The scores were not photographed individually, but we are fortunate to possess multiple inventories created at different points in time that speak to the evolving contents of Landowska's music library. When coupled with related subject files and correspondence, these materials present a detailed, if incomplete, picture of the state and fate of Landowska's treasured possessions. There are many other impactful items in the collection that colorize and contextualize the storied life of Landowska, programs, personal effects, financial documents, and posters, among others. The library even retains three of Landowska's velvet gowns and a bronze casting of her shoes. Despite her larger-than-life persona and magnificent projection in the concert hall, I can assure you that she was, in fact, quite petite in stature. We have a saying in the archives profession that the items not present in a collection often tell an important story of their own. And this is absolutely the case with the Landowska and Rustu materials. That said, the materials that we do have available for scholarship, for performance, 
for preservation of cultural heritage are of measurable value. We have witnessed the application of all three in tonight's event, and we will witness them continually as future generations explore the mystique and legacy of Vonda Lenovska. Thank you. I'm Barbara, he's Tom. And we first encountered the Play Elves now at the library in June of 2004, um, after Denise Ristu had died, and they had made it clear that they would like everything to come in the collection to the library, but it was not just the papers and the music that the library wanted, but everything had to come as well, the dresses and the instruments. And so the library asked us to go to Connecticut and look at the instruments in the house and recommend whether this was a good idea or not, and uh, assess, assess the instruments. So um, the instrument on stage was in the large front living room of the house and gave a pretty good overall impression initially. There was missing veneer from air uh, along the top edge and on the pedal wire. Um, it was dirty uh, with dust and mold and I regret to say cat spray covering everything from <laughs> knee level down as was everything in the house. Um, but it was recognizably in tune at A440, which uh, after all the years since her death is quite remarkable. The registers went on and off. The coupler, which is the mechanism that allows the keyboards to be played together from the lower one, uh, was highly inconsistent, as was the regulation. Um, there were some missing buff pads, um, but there was a clear indication that the jacks had been staggered, which was an important point to players. The second play all over in the uh, reading room next to Rachmaninoff's desk uh, was in another room with a small Steinway piano and a chalice clavichord. Having suffered from water damage and a bleaching of the finish, it did not present so well. There were more inconsistencies in the action, some of the pedals didn't work, and what did play was more irregular. Later we discovered that the nut, which holds the strings near the tuning pins, had become separated and shifted, which caused misalignment of the strings. We found a large supply of leather tongues, the leather plectra plucked the strings, regulating tools, cloth, and leather. And these materials were invaluable in making the musical finishing of the restoration cohesive. Curiously, there were no spare uh, strings, no covers, or moving equipment. The decision was made to conserve the playals as much as possible and make them functional without rebuilding, restringing, or refinishing. This approach preserves more of what Denise and Vanda actually felt and heard. Replacement of missing veneer helped to make them visually presentable. We recommended limited use of the instruments in order to preserve as much of their character as possible while allowing occasional performances to eliminate their influence in the early 20th century. Um, as with, in, in all of these instruments, the, the operative parts, the leather and the cloth and these materials tend to be the ones that suffer the most from use. So um, if you're trying to hang on to anything old, you have to watch your um, uh, use of it. It's important to understand that these instruments, while they're beautifully made uh, using excellent materials, are rather perversely engineered. They resemble a historical harpsichord only in that they have a plucking mechanism. The cast iron plate, massive framing, open bottom, you can look right up into the instrument from below, the thick soundboard and heavy keys with weighted jacks and a long scaling, which is the basic tonal design, requiring heavier strings, are simply not present in historical harpsichords. Leather plectra of a different type were occasionally used in earlier harpsichords, but bird quill was the norm. Recordings give the false impression that these instruments, with their five registers and four sets of strings, were loud. This is not the case. The thick soundboard and heavy framing dampen most of the resonance. 
Indeed, we've been told by the harpsichord maker William Dowd and harpsichordist Albert Fuller about attending a town hall concert at Flandowska in the early 1950s. The stage was darkened with only a couple of lamps for light. Landowska entered and spent several minutes arranging the pedals, carefully obscuring her feet with a long skirt so that no one could steal her registrations, Un until the audience noise subsided, and only then did she begin to play. Dowd tells of leaning forward in his seat to hear every nuance of the performance, but was highly disappointed by the volume the instrument produced. As makers and restorers of antique and historically accurate instruments, we would not have let a play all through our front door if it hadn't been Landowska's. Despite their influence on harpsichord design through the middle of the 20th century, Vanda's own characterization of them is telling. On her first trip to America in 1923, she's quoted as saying, I arrived there like a lion tamer, dragging along four large play all harpsichords. Since these creatures lumbered into our lives, we have felt like keepers in the big cat house at the zoo, often at feeding time. But at least for the moment, they seem to have stopped growling. <laughs> so I'll let Tom make other comments if he wants, but also we would talk to Tom a little bit about his registration and use of the instrument too. So sure, that would be great. But the, the main thing I was wondering about is uh, you mentioned that this, these are not engineered like uh, any historic harpsichord, and I wonder if you could go into a bit more detail about exactly what that would uh, look like from a, from a technical perspective, but also sound like. Well, from a, a, the, the main thing is that this is essentially a plucked piano, which is fine, I mean, it's, a, it's a musical instrument of its own, but really doesn't resemble very much the harpsichord that uh, Fonda was hoping to recreate. Uh, so, uh, for example, this weighs uh, about as much as a Steinway. It takes four people to move it, uh, piano movers to move it, uh, whereas a classical French harpsichord from the same period, uh, many of you have probably seen Barbara and I carrying it up the stairs after a concert. Uh, so, I mean, this is, in a way, it's if the classical French harpsichord were a Ferrari, this would be a Mack truck. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's wonderfully made, it's beautifully made, wonderful materials in it, but it is really perversely engineered. Uh, it's, it's sort of like, the, we had a colleague once who owned a, a Peugeot from the 1950s, and in order to change the headlight, the fender had to be removed. And it's very much the same thing here as a young man uh, who was supremely self-confident. Uh, I was sent off by Frank Hubbard to, uh, to fix the uh, play L of uh, the harpsichordist in Boston, Irma Rogel. And Frank told me, he said, if you, do, if you do anything, don't try to fix the coupler because you're going to be there for four or five hours. So about five o'clock at night, five o'clock in the afternoon, the coupler wasn't working and I thought I knew what it was doing. About 11 o'clock, uh, I departed with a very annoyed Miss Rugel. <laughs> coupler was fixed. <laughs> And uh, we actually took it apart for the first time since it was restored in uh, 2007, seven, eight. Um, we, we really did take it apart last week because in fact the coupler <laughs> was, was showing signs of wear and needed to be uh, regulated. And it took, we were astonished because even knowing what we were looking for and having the right tools at hand and everything, it took the better part of two hours to dismantle it sufficiently. Um, uh, fortunately, the library sent a, a photographer that day so that things that people will probably not see for another 25 years were documented. And then we thought, well, it'll certainly go back together faster, and it was close to two hours, <laughs> just because of the, the very uh, clever but um, totally unnecessary way that it's assembled. Um, One of the really moving one of the really moving things for us was 
uh, at the home in Lakeville. Uh, this harpsichord was sitting there. This was an instrument that she had made all of her recordings on. Most of the recordings uh, that she did for RCA were actually made in the Lakeville house. And uh, RC had ra arranged a system where she could step on a little foot pedal when the muse struck her, and she could record. And then she would call up the next, she would call the next morning, and a technician would take the train up and change the reels of tape. Uh, but through the modern world of CDs, we were able to hear this harpsichord being played by Vonda in her own house. And it, it just, it, it was really, it was one of those incredible things. Of, of, of well, it was, um, yeah, to, yeah, to, to amplify on that, the, the executors uh, for the estate who had met us to let us into the house after we were finished, they said, oh, have you heard her play? Um, they were not musicians, and the, so we said, oh, yes, but, well, why don't you listen to this CD while we're finishing up some things here? And so they left us in the living room, yes, with this instrument, and put on the Goldberg Variations or whatever it was for us. And we got truly goosebumpy just standing in that room where she had made the recording, listening to as if the ghost of Vonda were in the room playing. It was true. Um, I wanted to ask you how, uh, sp how exactly did Ludoslavsky um, specify the registration? He didn't. He didn't? He uh -huh. didn't, yeah. Okay. My one of my own inventions, based on listening to... I mean, to very nice, but oh, thank I was you. curious. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I spent a while listening to other Landowska recordings and how yep. she used this instrument, and mm -hmm. I found that most of the time she plays on two manuals, if there's a melody and accompaniment. Yep. And I'm guessing that that's because there's a voicing difference in this instrument versus a more um, historical historically authentic instrument. It doesn't seem to favor treble melody as much as I was expecting it to. So mm -hmm. I often find that I am imagining more melody and accompaniment mm -hmm. than I mm -hmm. would on a, uh, on mm -hmm. a more mm -hmm. common instrument today. Mm -hmm. So that hence the, the two manuals and the buff stop for the accompaniment. Right. For those of you who maybe aren't quite sure what we're talking about and uh, can't see exactly here, on the pedal liar down here, which is of course a modern uh, thing, we don't find this on antique instruments, um, uh, but Playel, you know, the thing is Playel made fabulous pianos uh, through the 18th century into the 20th, or 19th century into the 20th century. He was her piano maker, which is why she went to him and sort of, you know, browbeat him into creating this instrument for her, which is more or less what that inscription says, which is I, I made this thing with a 16 foot because Vanda made me do it. But it has, let me see, one, two, three, seven. four, seven, seven pedals, uh, which are very close together, and which Vonda, with her little tiny, you know, less than five foot uh, tall feet, she put ballet slippers on in order to maneuver all of this very cleverly in here. Tom was saying, oh, I should have worn my organ shoes, I forgot. <laughs> it would have been really um, helpful. And even so, with his big feet, he's still able to sort of manage <laughs> this. But it's very, it's extremely, uh, tricky knowing exactly what needs to be up and what needs to be down and when and how and um, I've seen people demonstrating this instrument at concerts in the past who have gotten completely flummoxed thinking they had set it up right and then somehow got off and then perhaps got everything off and couldn't <laughs> turn anything back on. So if Tom wants, to, I thought your um, registration in the um, Bersus was really Oh, thank interesting. You. Thank Clever. you very much. So if you wanted to say anything more about that or demonstrate it. I'm no, sure it, was, it was a very similar registration, but I, another thing I found is that the four foot stop played down an octave has a very different effect than the eight foot stop played mm -hmm. at pitch. And that mm -hmm. was an effect that I used in the verses to, mm -hmm. again, to try to bring the melody to the four, yeah. which this yeah. instrument seems to have a little bit of um, trouble with normally. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
it's a sort of a political in-joke at the time. I did a lot of reading about this, and it's a story that does not bear telling tonight, but <laughs> it's a very uh, dramatic um, uh, sort of portrayal of, of different characters that Cooper had in mind. And um, the reason both of these pieces, that, that I chose both of these pieces for tonight, is that they both appeared on a program when von Lebowska played here at the Library of Congress. So these are sort of returning home these pieces uh, with this instrument here at this stage.
Thank you all for joining us. A big thanks to my colleagues and to Parks and Clark. Good night.